evening to our live audience here in Chicago, our viewers watching and listening online, to our candidates, moderator, political correspondents, broadcasting sp partners and sponsors, to every individual taking the time to care to watch this historic debate tonight. No matter where you are tuning in, no matter what party or group to which you belong, this debate is for individuals. The voter, the taxpayer, the hard-working middle-class worker, the struggling single parent on minimum wage, the small business owner, everyone. I'm Christina Tobin of Free and Equal Elections Foundation, and I welcome and thank all of you for being here tonight. Tonight, we are all taking part in something good and real and honest and open without debate contracts and private interests controlling. <laughs> without them controlling the questions we ask and the answers and the candidates deliver, free, open, and fair. Free and Equal works to improve the electoral system of the United States by bringing the elections back to the people where it belongs. We do this by opening the debates, improving ballot access laws, and forming nonpartisan coalitions to unite people and organizations across the political spectrum who also want free, open, and fair elections. Tonight's debate is the first of its kind, and our sponsors represent a diverse group of media, businesses, musicians, radio personalities, organizations, and individuals representing all types of political ideologies. I imagine our audience is just as diverse. Tonight, you will meet four presidential candidates. Two of them lean to the left, while the other two lean a little more to the right, giving us a perfect balance of ideas and viewpoints on how to fix our broken nation. These candidates secured enough ballot lines to be here today. In the future, we hope to have more resources so we can open the debate even further with more debates, more candidates at every level of government. <laughs> Ultimately, we, the people, are responsible for our government. If we don't pay attention, if we don't vote, if we don't protest or discuss important issues with friends, co-workers, and classmates, then we get more of the same, the same corrupt, dysfunctional system, no matter who's in charge. But if we turn off the distractions and listen and learn and read and question more about who's really benefiting and educate ourselves on how we really got here, and figure out how each of us can make a positive impact. That's the way to change a system. Knowledge sharing, truth seeking, open debates, fresh ideas, and discovering a common ground amongst each other. No matter what's your political persuasion, we are at a critical time in our nation's history. It's time to take our country back from the private interests who control our beliefs, our opinions, and our lives. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Our moderator this evening is award-winning broadcaster and media personality, Larry King. Down, down. down. His, his new online home is Aura TV, and he is the host of Larry King Now. Welcome, Larry. Thank you. And uh, welcome, everybody. I'm very happy to be doing this. I think all voices should be heard. A few notes about the format for tonight's debate. It's a really easy job for me because it's a rather simple format. Each candidate will have an opportunity to make a two-minute opening statement. The order of these statements have been randomly determined. Six questions will be asked in all in the 90 minutes. The questions have been selected from submissions made via social media. After a question is asked, each candidate will have two minutes to answer it. Each candidate will have a total of six opportunities in all. Once all four candidates gave their two-minute uh, responses, they'll each have an additional one minute to expand or not expand. They can choose to respond or not. Candidates can use their additional minutes or save their time to use it later. 
we will wrap up with a two-minute closing statement from each candidate. And with that, let me introduce these four independent candidates. First, Jill Stein, the mother, uh, mother of physician, longtime teacher of internal medicine, and the Green Party nominee for president. Jill Stein. As, uh, as you can already tell, we are permitting audience participation. We're in downtown Chicago, by the way, at the Hilton Hotel. Next is Rocky Anderson, the former mayor of Salt Lake City and the Justice, Depart the Justice Party nominee for president. Next is Virgil Hamlin Good Jr., former member of the U.S. House of Representatives and the Constitution Party nominee for president. And the final independent candidate is uh, former Governor Gary Johnson. This is man, former governor of New Mexico. And Gary is the Gary is the Libertarian Party nominee. The first question for tonight's topic is our electoral system. This question is from the Free and Equal Elections Foundation hosting this debate and will be asked by Christina Tobin. Christina? Well, thank you. We'll start from the left to the right, and here's our question. A top two primary is an election in which party labels appear on the ballot, but parties do not nominate candidates. Instead, the candidates choose their own ballot label. All candidates run in the primary, but only the top two vote getters appear on the ballot in the November election. The system is currently used in Louisiana, Washington State, and California. It is now a ballot measure in Arizona, Prop 121, with other states interested in adopting the system. What is your position on the top two primary system and why? Let's we'll start with Jill Stein. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and, and again, thank you so much to Free and Equal and to all of you for being here. Um, yes, I think top two does not enlarge our democracy. In many ways, it confuses things more. It puts many candidates onto the ballot altogether, and it arbitrarily attaches party labels to them, any candidate can choose any label they want, so it really degrades the meaning of our political parties, uh, where they have meaning, and I know they don't always, but there are some that do have meaning that aren't bought and sold to the highest bidder, and the Green Party is, is one of those parties, and I know there are some other parties uh, here as well, the independent parties, where the party actually represents real values, and the uh, the top two obscures the meaning of those parties and it essentially puts everyone in together so you really can't tell who's representing you and whoever has the biggest budget stands to win that primary and essentially it becomes another way that big money can control our elections. So I oppose top two as the Green Party does and we actually support a whole variety of election reforms for the purpose of enlarging our democracy, not increasing the sellout of our democracy. We are calling for getting money out of politics through public financing. We're calling for opening up the airwaves to all qualified candidates. We are calling for a constitutional ten amendment sec ten seconds, to clarify Jill. that Money is not speech, and that corporations are not people to take back our constitutional rights. All right, Joe, thank you. All right, next, uh, for two minutes, Rocky Anderson. Rocky? The top two system is a simply a continuation of the degradation of our democracy by this duopoly of the Republican and Democratic parties. Our electoral system has been so constricted 
our democracy so degraded by these two parties from the very beginning in terms of ballot access, even getting on the ballot so you can give people choices, this top two option would simply tell the duopoly, you just go ahead and keep raising all your money, you put your own candidates out there, you could even have just two people from the same political party, and that means no choice for the voters. Last night, last night, and all these presidential and vice presidential debates, look how constricted the debate has been when you've had two parties there, the Republicans and the Democrats. They're arguing about who's going to spend more on the military budget. Barack Obama last night bragging that he's increased the military budget every year that he's been in office. They're both trying to outdo each other in terms of who's going to drill more, both offshore and on public lands. And neither of them even dares to talk about getting rid of this disastrous, failed war on drugs. Neither of them talk about <laughs> catastrophic climate change. And neither of them talk about poverty when we've got the worst poverty rate in this country since 1965. So we need to open up the choices. In South Africa, the world rejoiced at the growth of their democracy following apartheid. I've got the ballot, the first ballot in their presidential election that had 18 people's names on it. Right, that's real democracy, and that's giving the voters real choice. Uh, Rocky, just one quick question. When you were mayor, what party were you in? Well, I was in the Democratic Party, but it was a nonpartisan office. I was a Democratic candidate okay. for Congress in 1996, but I've had it with the Democratic Party. Mm. Uh, Virgil Good, what party were you in? I was the Independent, Democrat, Republican, and now I'm in the Constitution Party. Always conservative. Okay, your response for two minutes to the initial question. Thank you, Larry. First, I want to say thanks to you for being here, for lending uh, your name and your prestige to this event, and to thank Free and Equal for their hard work in bringing a much broader vision to the American people so they will know they've got more choices than just Obama and Romney. I do not favor the top two uh, system. I agree with Jill when she said money is not speech and that the top two system enhances those that have the most money. However, I am not for public financing. I was not in favor of $100 million for the Democratic National Convention of taxpayer money, $100 million to the Republican National Convention of taxpayer money. The top two system is primarily a state issue. I would not be in favor of federal legislation repealing what Louisiana has done or telling Virginia or telling Maine or telling uh, uh, Arizona or New Mexico, any state, what they should do. But we've got to work at every state and every legislature and oppose top two. In my view, it's a hindrance to true democracy for grassroots Americans that don't want to be controlled by super PACs and PACs. All right. And our final speaker on this topic, I know you were a Republican as uh, governor of New Mexico. Gary Johnson, your response. Well, uh, running for uh, governor of New Mexico <clears throat> as a Republican, I ran completely outside of the political system. Completely. I mean, I in went and I introduced myself to the Republican Party two weeks before I ran. And they said, you know what? We like you. We like what you've got to say. We're, t we're completely inclusive. You can go and you can make your case to all Republicans in this state. You know, take part in the debates, take part in the discussions. Well, that's the way that politics should be. I was able to make that presentation. I was able to make that case. And by the way, the Republican Party chairman at that time said, now you can do all this stuff, but you just need to know that you'll never get elected because it's not possible 
to become, get elected governor in a state that's two to one Democrat. Well, I did get elected. So as governor of New Mexico, completely outside of the political system, I've always been pro-choice regarding everything, okay? So should this be top two voting, uh, top two candidates voting system? This should be something that gets ferreted out at the local level. This should be something that gets ferreted out at the state level, not the national level. Look, there is only a couple of voices being heard here, and it's Tweedledee and it's Tweedledum. It's two weeks ago. It's two weeks ago, two candidates talking about who's going to spend more money on Medicare when Medicare is a system that you and I pay $30,000 into and get a $100,000 benefit. It's a three to one what you pay in and what you get out. It's not sustainable. Yet it's indicative of our federal government today, which is on an absolute unsustainable path, the results of which are going to be a monetary collapse unless we actually bring this under control. And as a third Ten party, seconds. I've been given the opportunity here to make the case that's not being made by either of the two major candidates. Thank you, Governor. By the way, just, just a quick personal, a lot of people ask me why I would consent to do this. One, I like moderating, and two, I like asking questions, even though I didn't ask these questions, they were submitted. And three, I think these people deserve a lot of credit for coming forward. It's easy to sit back and watch these people stand up. They may not be counted on November 6th, but they're counting today, and they deserve to be heard. We have a... Each is now entitled to a one-minute response if they care to use it. Jill? Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to mention, talking about how all of us need to stand up and demand real democracy and demand free and open, inclusive debates, I just want to mention that my running mate and I went to the doorstep of the Commission on Presidential Debates at Hofstra University last week and that we were arrested, we were tightly bound with plastic restraints and tied to chairs for eight hours for daring to stand up and demand open debates. But this is what all of us need to do. I encourage you to go to my website, jillstein.org, and sign the petition there for opening the debates and for challenging the Commission right. on Presidential Debates. We should not let okay, them Jill. do this again. Right. Rocky? Rocky, you have one minute. A top two system is a sign that these two parties, this du political duopoly in this country, is trying to further put their stranglehold on our democracy. We have to stand up together. And in federal elections, it is a federal matter. We shouldn't leave it to the states. The corrupting influence of money in this country is at the root of every major public policy disaster. It's why we don't have health care for all, as in the rest of the industrialized world. It's why we aren't providing international leadership on the climate crisis because of all the corrupting money coming from the fossil fuel industry and it's why we have this enormously wasteful military budget with this military industrial complex putting pressure on congress and the white house five seconds so we need public financing of elections for our democracy we need Virgil. free and equal access okay, to the public airwaves thank Virgil. you virgil one minute Thank you. The top two system, as others have indicated, favors the super PACs and the political action committees. They're political action committees, not just of businesses, but of unions. I'm for no political action committee, individual contributions only, and no super PACs. And I believe Congress can craft legislation with presidential leadership to stop political action committees. Big money that funnels through the PACs is the greatest hindrance, in my opinion, to free and open elections and freedom and democracy in this country. We threw off the king in the time of the revolution because of heavy handedness. We need to throw the PACs out now and vote for third parties that will stand up for America. All right. I'm reminded that. This is a rebuttal one minute. You can use it or not use it, Governor. 
Well, I think that when it comes to political campaign contributions, that uh, candidates should be required to wear NASCAR-like jackets with patches on the jackets commensurate. So what's really needed is 100% transparency. I will tell you that regardless of whether or not Romney gets elected or Obama gets elected, three things are going to happen. We're going to find ourselves with a continued heightened police state in this country. We're going to find ourselves continuing to militarily intervene in the world, which results has resulted in hundreds of millions of enemies to this country that wouldn't otherwise exist. There's a reason why we shouldn't be using drones. It's because we don't just take out the target. We take out a lot of innocent civilians in these countries where these drones attack. All right. And then lastly, we are going to find ourselves in a continued state of unsustainable spending okay. and borrowing to the point that we are going to experience a monetary collapse unless we fix this. Well, thank you, Governor. Tonight's uh, second question, all questions submitted by social media, was submitted by Jeff Tangway of Colorado via Facebook. The question is, in what ways does the war on drugs impact Americans, and how could these effects be reduced? Is there a more efficient way to deal with the issue of drug use in America? Two minutes, Jill Stein. It's Rocky, actually. Rocky, you go first on this one. Oh, Rocky goes first. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. No, Thank right. you Thank for you. correcting You're welcome. me. Okay. The war well, we, on... Wait, just so we understand, as each question comes up, a different person... How about person's... opening statements? A different person start. Did we have opening statements? Unfortunately, no. We didn't? No. Okay, Grassroots. To? <laughs> Let's go ahead and do opening. Let's do opening statements. My apologies. I, I didn't know we had opening statements. I thought we were right to the question. So two, two minutes. So let's start on the left there, and then we'll go with our second question, starting with Rocky. Opening statements, two minutes each. Okay, Jill, this will be Jill opening Stein. statements, and then we'll go to the second <laughs> question. Thank Jill, you. Jill Stein, please. Thank you, Gary. Good, Jill. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Always glad to lead. <laughs> the American people are in crisis. We are losing our jobs, decent wages, our homes by the millions, affordable health care and higher education. The climate is in meltdown and our civil liberties are under attack. The wealthy few are richer than ever, rolling in more dough than ever, and the political establishment is not only not making it better, they're actually making it worse, imposing austerity on everyday people while they continue to squander trillions of dollars on wars for oil that we don't need, on Wall Street bailouts, and tax breaks for the very wealthy. The American people, the American people are at the breaking point, and we need to turn that breaking point in this election into a tipping point to take back our democracy and the peaceful, just, green future that we deserve. And we do that by standing up and making sure that everyday people have a voice in this election and a choice at the polls that's not bought and paid for by Wall Street and by advancing the critical solutions that the American people are clamoring for by large majorities. Our campaign is calling for a Green New Deal to create 25 million jobs, end unemployment, jumpstart the green economy, and that means putting a halt to climate change and making wars for oil obsolete. We're calling for health care as a human right through Medicare for All and for bailing out the students, not the banks and making public Hi, higher Joe. education free. Joe, thumbs up. By the way, it was, not in my, Governor, it was not in my notes about an opening statement, so I apologize. There should have been an opening statement, but it was not my in apologies. my notes, because I follow my notes. Okay. <laughs> I'm a Jewish guy from Brooklyn. We do what we're told. <laughs> Rocky, Larry, opening. Larry, more people are here to listen to you than us. Thank you for being here and giving us Thank this you. opportunity. Rocky, two minutes. We are at a pivotal moral point in our nation's history. We've all suffered through the sellout of our government to Wall Street, 
Young people are burdened with crushing record tuition debt. Millions of families have lost their homes. Retirement accounts have been decimated, while Wall Street fat cats who are buying our elections have made out like bandits. We've never had the disparity in income and wealth that we see between the very wealthy and all the rest of us since the 1920s. Our poverty rate has never been so high since 1965. Child poverty and infant mortality rates in the United States are next to the worst in the industrialized world and among 50 nations. The United States has the worst rate of women dying in connection with pregnancy and childbirth. And under Obamacare, there will be 30 million people without essential health care by the year 2022. And during the Bush and the Obama years, our Constitution has been shredded while the imperial presidency has expanded with presidents who think they can unilaterally take us to war, often on a pack of lies, with presidents who think the federal government should have the authority to round anyone up, including U.S. citizens, and imprison them up to the rest of their lives without charges, without trial, without legal representation, and without the right of habeas corpus. And our elected officials are sound asleep when the Pentagon is warning that climate change is a greater long-term security risk to the United States than terrorism. Okay, so if you like the way things are going, vote Democratic or Republican. If you want real change, vote your conscience, vote justice. Opening. Economic justice, social okay, justice, okay, and Rock. environmental justice. Back to our opening after the first question, opening statement from Virgil Good. <clears throat> Thank you, Larry. I want to say thanks to Jill, Gary, and Rocky for being here on the four issues I'm going to address right now. You can deduce their uh, positions from what I say. But I'm going to name four positions that I am very different from Ob uh, Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. First, Obama and Romney both claim that they were and still are for a balanced budget. Reality. The Obama budget this year was $1 trillion in deficit. The Paul Ryan budget, which passed the U.S. House, was $600 billion in deficit. I have the courage to submit a balanced budget if I'm elected president right after I'm inaugurated. Secondly, I am for jobs in America for American citizens first and the only candidate that has called for a near complete moratorium on green card admissions to the United States until unemployment is under 5 percent. It makes no sense to bring in so many foreign workers when unemployment is so high in this country. Secondly, third. We're running close we, on time. Go ahead. Right, we need to end super PACs and political action committees that would be one of the best things that would open up our country for more democratic process and a greater voice by the people. And lastly, we need term limits. It's time to focus on doing the best job in Congress instead of the next election and the next fundraiser. And now an opening statement from Governor Johnson. The country is in really deep trouble. We should not bomb Iran. We should get We should end the war in Afghanistan tomorrow. Bring the troops home tomorrow. Yeah. Marriage equality is a constitutionally guaranteed right on par with civil rights of the 60s. Let's end <clears throat> Let's end the drug wars. Legalize marijuana now. Let's repeal the Patriot Act. I would have never signed the National Defense Authorization Act allowing for you and I as U.S. citizens to be arrested and detained without being charged. That's the reason we fought wars in this country.
I promise to submit a balanced budget to Congress in the year 2013. That is a $1.4 trillion reduction in federal spending. If we don't do this now, we are going to find ourselves in a monetary collapse, and a monetary collapse, very simply, is when the dollars we have in our pocket don't buy a thing because of the accompanying inflation that goes along with borrowing and printing money to the tune of 43 cents out of every dollar we spend. I'm the only candidate that wants to eliminate income tax, eliminate corporate tax, <laughs> abolish the IRS, and replace all of that with one federal consumption tax, the fair tax. I think it right. reboots the American economy. It's the answer to it's the answer to our exports. It's the answer to American okay. jobs. Okay, two minutes. All right. And now, thank you, Gary. We'll now get to the second question. I'll repeat it, and we'll start to go around with, with Rocky. In what ways does the war on drugs impact Americans? How could the effects be reduced? Is there a more efficient way to deal with the issue of drug use in America that was submitted by Jeff Tangway via Facebook? The war on drugs has been catastrophic for our country, a waste of national treasure and unbelievable human tragedy. I remember when Bert Stringfellow came to me and told me about his son, Corey, who had been sentenced on his first drug offense to 15 and a half years in a federal penitentiary. Well, when I became mayor, I worked really hard with the Clinton White House, and on the day that President Clinton left the White House, he signed a presidential pardon, saving Corey Stringfellow a decade in a federal penitentiary. <laughs> Weldon Angeles is sitting in a federal penitentiary today with a 55-year sentence for selling marijuana on three occasions because the informant said there was a gun around somewhere, not that he'd used it, that there was a gun present. So with gun enhancements, m mandatory gun enhancements, and the judge that, who had to enter the sentence said it was an outrage, it was unjust, but 55 years. This is the kind of human toll in this country. We don't just need to legalize marijuana. We need to end drug prohibition just like we ended alcohol prohibition and treat drug use and abuse as a public health and education issue and get it entirely out of the criminal justice Thank system. We, we have the largest incarceration rate in the world by far. We have 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prison population. We have more people in prison and jails in this country on drug offenses than Western Europe has in their prisons and jails on all offenses. Ten seconds. This has to end. We, the American people, need to come together. Right, left, it doesn't matter about partisanship. We need to demand immediately right. an end to this insane war on drugs. <laughs> Virgil Good. Thank you. I am an advocate of a balanced budget now, not 10 years down the road, and I would cut federal spending on the war on drugs. However, drug use is primarily a state issue, not a federal issue, but there are federal laws. I am not, and this is going to not set well with most of you, I am not for uh, legalizing marijuana use or other drug use. Uh, if we cut back on the war on drugs, that would be a minor part of the federal budget. About $12 billion is being spent this year out of a $3.8 trillion budget on the war on drugs. But there are a lot of small things. I'm not for funding Planned Parenthood. I'd take that to zero. I am. <laughs> I'm not for funding uh, on, public oh, broadcasting. We're on drugs. We're on drugs. I know, but I'm just pointing out that how small the federal war on drug money is in terms of the entire budget. But I am for reducing it because we've got to reduce nearly everything that's generally funded in order to get to a balanced budget. All right. Governor uh, Johnson, the war on drugs. 90% of the drug problem is prohibition related, not use related, and that is not to discount the problems with use and abuse, but that should be the focus. 
So let's legalize marijuana now. And right now in this country, we are at a tipping point on this issue. 50% of Americans now support legalizing marijuana. Why is this the case? It's because we're talking about it. It's because debates and discussions are raging at dinner tables that haven't been raging at dinner tables in the past. So let's regulate it. Let's tax it. It's on the ballot in Colorado in November. Coloradans have the opportunity here really to change drug policy worldwide. Coloradans get it. Citizens of Denver six years ago voted to decriminalize marijuana on a campaign based on marijuana being safer than alcohol. I am not a hypocrite on this issue. I have drank alcohol, I've smoked marijuana. I don't drink alcohol, I don't smoke marijuana, but I can tell you categorically, in no category is marijuana more dangerous than alcohol. And yet, And yet we are arresting 1.8 million people a year in this country on drug-related crime. We have the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world, 2.3 million people. Half of what we spend on law enforcement, the courts, and the prisons is drug-related, and to what end? Look, this is not about advocating drug use. 50% of kids graduating from high school have smoked marijuana. That's an issue that belongs with families, not in the criminal justice system. All right, thank you, Governor. That's time up. Jill, you're... Does you're, anybody you're, have any rebuttals? Go ahead, Jill. They, uh, I, I have to make my statement oh, first, sorry. and then, and then the rebuttals. Thank you. Um, so as a medical doctor, uh, previously in clinical practice for about 25 years, I can say with a real understanding of the science and the health impacts that marijuana is a substance that is dangerous because it's illegal. It's not illegal on account of being dangerous because it's not dangerous at all. It is well understood that the health impacts of marijuana are mainly the public health and safety impacts from the illegal drug trade associated with marijuana prohibition. So the most important thing we can do to get rid of the health problems associated with marijuana is to legalize it. And on day one, on day one, a president, if she wanted to, could instruct the DEA to do a really radical, radical thing. And that would be to use science in determining what substances will and will not be scheduled. Because the minute science is used, marijuana is off the schedule. And the same goes, the same goes for hemp, which is also a substance for which there are no bad drug effects. There are no bad health and safety effects. Yet there are very important economic benefits. Both of those substances should be legalized. Marijuana should be uh, regulated, but in a way that does not create another tobacco monopoly, okay. but permits small businesses right, so to actually flourish. Now, if anyone wants to rebut, raise your hand. You want to rebut, Rocky? Yes. And I'm not sure it's a real rebuttal because I'm in total agreement, especially, well, on all issues that Jill raised. But hemp, really? Why is that illegal? Except for those moneyed interests that control our Congress? We need to rise up as one and say, legalize industrial hemp now. Okay. Anyone want to rebut? Well, my time is not okay. up I, right. I don't mean to quibble like okay. the President and Romney do. With That's the, one minute. 40,000 people, less than 40,000 people in prison on drug charges in 1971 when this war on drugs began. Now we have over a half million of our people in prisons. I would entertain as president a presidential pardon for everyone that didn't commit other crimes that's in our federal prisons okay. because of drug offenses. Anyone want to rebut? Remember, we have. 
We have six questions in all. We're only finishing the second one. Anyone else want to rebut? When I was governor of New Mexico, I met with judges in Portland, Oregon that asked to meet with me. Um, they, we, the meeting started. I didn't know what to expect, but what they said was, hey, we're here to support you. We're here to support what you have to say, but we would like to share with you a story here that perhaps you can pass, only have on, a minute. pass on to others that would let others better understand this. They said that uh, methamphetamine really is the boogeyman drug. People that use methamphetamine uh, do bad things. Their behavior is altered. They said, we're not suggesting, and by the way, it disparagingly falls on the poor. It's, it's the best example we can think of of a prohibition drug. It's cheap, it's easy to make, so the consequences fall disparagingly on the poor. They said, we're not suggesting the following, but if cocaine were legal, these people would be using cocaine without the negative behavioral impact. Now, what I will tell you about cocaine, and it would be wonderful if the government told the truth, cocaine puts holes in your heart. Really, people that use cocaine their entire lives time, die Gary. from a heart attack. Whitney Houston is the best example right, of somebody Gary, of who time. uses cocaine Gary. all the time. Okay. All right. Uh, One minute rebuttal. Go ahead, Virgil. Right. <clears throat> Let's be clear about my position on this. Unlike Gary, unlike Rocky, and unlike Jill, I'm not for legalizing drugs. If you want that, vote for one of them. Don't vote for me. Okay, now, well said. Uh, we remind you that tonight's debate questions were submitted via social media, and I'm presenting them exactly as they were received. The next topic, and we'll start with this one with Virgil, uh, concerns foreign policy. It comes from Greg Salazar of Los Angeles via Reddit. Do you think that an annual military budget of nearly $1 trillion is absolutely necessary to keep us safe? And in a broader sense, what do you think should be the role worldwide of the United States military? Two minutes, Virgil Good. As I said, if I'm elected president, I'll balance the budget and part of the cuts have to be in the Department of Defense. We cannot do, as Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan suggest, increase military funding by $2 trillion over the next uh, decade. I support a strong defense, but we need to retrench rather than trying to be the policeman of the world. We have too many soldiers, too many uh, troopers scattered around the world. Our bases need to be reduced around the world, not increased, and the United States should stop trying to be the overseer of the world. That will save us billions and billions of dollars. All right, Governor Johnson. Let me start with a premise here. We need to provide ourselves with a strong national defense. It's one of government's fundamental responsibilities. But the operative word here is defense, not offense, and not nation building. The biggest threat to our national security is the fact that we're bankrupt, that we're borrowing and we're printing money to the tune of 43 cents out of every dollar that we spend. So I am promising to submit a balanced budget to Congress in the year 2013 that would include a 43% reduction in military spending. How does that go down? Well, a 43% reduction in military spending takes us back to 2003 spending levels. It's getting ourselves out of all the military engagements that we are in currently involved in. Stop with the military interventions. It's reducing the military footprint worldwide, its bases, its it's troops that we have stationed in uh, Japan, in South Korea, and in Europe. It's intelligence, it's research and development. Uh, all of these components go into a 43% reduction uh, when it comes to the military. We have to stop our military interventions. We have to stop with the drone strikes. We have to stop with a policy that has us with hundreds of millions of enemies to this country that but for these policies would otherwise not exist. It's a recognition that when we talk about foreign aid to other countries, it's propping up foreign dictators that are on our side as opposed to the other side. We pick winners and losers. And there are a whole lot of unintended consequences that go along with this. Right now, we're, we're funding the Syrian insurgents, and they're made up of jihadists? Five Did seconds. we not learn anything in Afghanistan where we funded Osama bin Laden? All right. Um, 
Discussing military spending, Jill. Yes, I, I want to agree with uh, Gary and uh, with Rocky, and, and I guess not with Virgil in this instance, uh, to say that a foreign policy based on militarism and brute military force and wars for oil is making us less secure, not more secure. We need to cut the budget and bring the troops home. And we need to end the drone wars, not bring the drones home because they're already coming home. We need to put an end to the use of drones and actually lead, not to lead this development of a new arms race, but to lead in an international treaty and a convention to permanently ban the use of drones as a weapon of war and as a means of spying on the American public. Five trillion dollars spent on the Afghanistan and Iraq war, thousands of American lives, hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians. This has not made us more secure. Uh, and it, what we're seeing, in fact, is the blowback against this policy. Because dropping bombs on weddings and funerals, which is what drones do with an incredibly high civilian casualty rate, that is not a good way to win the hearts and minds of people in the Middle East. 30 seconds. We need, we need a foreign policy based on international rights, on, on international law, and on human rights, and on fighting climate change, which should be the war that we are all fighting, not this war for oil. All right. And now, the, also on the question of uh, military spending, and then we'll have a rebuttal if anyone raises their hand and wants to. Again, we have three more questions coming. On military spending, Rocky. President Eisenhower, in his last presidential address, warned this country about the military-industrial complex. When he first wrote that speech, he termed it the military-industrial-congressional complex, and for very good reason, because these folks vote for massive funding for completely wasteful projects, like the F-22 that the Department of Defense said we're never going to use it, it's outmoded. Why would we spend billions of dollars on it? And because the contractor had other contractors or subcontractors in 44 different states, and they do that very strategically, these people, the Republicans and Democrats alike, voted for additional funding. That is treason against our country when our treasure is being wasted, when we need that treasure to go toward education, jobs, and the biggest challenge facing our planet, and that is combating climate change. We need to focus on where the real public interest is rather than where those who are benefiting from this corrupt system are, are, have their stake. Now, there are two fundamentals when it comes to our engagement, military engagement, I think our leaders have completely either forgotten it or ignoring it. First, no wars of aggression. If you haven't been attacked or you're not imminently going to be attacked, it to attack and occupy another country like we did Iraq is an illegal war of aggression under the Kellogg-Briand Pact, under the United Nations Charter against the Nuremberg Principles. At the Nuremberg Tribunal, we prosecuted and convicted people for those same crimes. And secondly, our Constitution requires that the decision whether to go to war is Congress's alone. They have the sole prerogative. It cannot be delegated to the President as right. Congress has so cowardly done with the Gulf of Tonkin resolution and later okay, the resolution for right. the use of force against Anyone the want to rebut? Nations. You want to rebut uh, Virgil? Very briefly. Rocky is correct about following the Constitution. I would not be in Syria unless Congress makes a declaration of war. We will not stay in Afghanistan if I'm elected president unless Congress makes a declaration of war. Only by going through that constitutional process will, can we ensure that the will of the American people is addressed when we have issues like Syria, okay. Afghanistan, and Iran. Is there any, now this has to be rebuttal. If you, if you, you want to rebut something, Gary? Well, okay. Please. <laughs> it's a rebuttal question. 
I was opposed to going into Iraq before we went into Iraq. Um, I did not think there were weapons of mass destruction, and I said in 2003, if there are weapons of mass destruction, we have the military surveillance capability to see that happen, and if that happens, uh, we have all sorts of options. But if we go into uh, Iraq, we're going to find ourselves in a civil war uh, to which there would be no end. Afghanistan, I thought initially that that was totally warranted. We were attacked, we attacked back, but I would argue that after having been in Afghanistan for six months, we wiped out Al-Qaeda. That was 11 years ago. We should have gotten out of Afghanistan 11 years ago. So here we are now on Iran, the largest demonstration in the world in support of the United States after 9-11 was in Iran by over one million citizens that showed up in support of the United States. And we're going to bomb Iran. We're going to bomb the citizens of Iran. We're going to find okay. ourselves with another 100 million enemies to this country that we right. wouldn't otherwise okay. have. No, uh, uh, I think both candidates said they would not bomb Iran, though. Just, but I, I would like the questions to be rebuttal so we can move along. This is our fourth question. The economy is the topic for this fourth debate question. The question was submitted by Nico Torino via tout. Since this was done via tout, let's go to his question on the video. Some estimates give a college education in the year 2030 a price tag of nearly $400,000. Is college really worth it at that point? And if so, how do we provide that opportunity to everyone? So the question, if you didn't hear it, was some estimates give the pricing of college education in the year 2030 at maybe $400,000. I don't know if that's correct, but his question was, is college even worth it at that point? If so, how would you provide the opportunity of college for everyone? And this question should begin with Governor Johnson. Well, first of all, uh, as governor of New Mexico, we established lottery scholarships, which allowed really any uh, graduating high school student from New Mexico to go to college with those costs paid. So what's the federal role, though, when it comes to education? And what's the primary reason in this country why college tuition is so high? Well, it's because of guaranteed government student loans, that because of guaranteed government student loans, no one has the excuse for not going to education. And so because of that, institutions of higher learning, colleges and universities, are immune from pricing that if kids would take a harder look at it, gee, I don't think I can afford $15,000 a semester. I think I'll just sit this one out when that happens in mass, I guarantee you the cost of college tuition will drop dramatically. But today, that's, that, that is a situation that doesn't exist. I can't afford $15,000, and yet friends and family will point and say, look, you can get a guaranteed government student loan. That is another one of government's unintended consequences that have college tuition at such a high rate. Stein. And Jill. So uh, I, I think it's time to make public higher education free as it should be. We've done this before when our troops came home from the Second World War. We provided free higher education uh, through the GI Bill. And we know that it pays for itself. For every dollar that we invested as taxpayers, seven dollars was returned in benefits to the economy, including more than enough revenue to cover the full cost of those tuition payments. This is something throughout the 20th century. Throughout the 20th century, we provided a high school education for free to our younger generation. Why? Because it was essential for economic security. And we owe it to our younger generation to give them a secure start into their economic lives. But in the 21st century, a high school degree won't cut it. You need a college degree in order to have economic security. So it's only right that we should now be providing that for free. And while we're at it, and while we're at it, it's time to 
Instead of bail out Wall Street for the fourth time, which is what the Fed is doing right now, with QE3, $40 billion a month to bail out Wall Street banks again, instead, let's bail out the students and do something really useful with that bailout. Okay, time's up. On the question of college, uh, Rocky. Well, thank you. Our forebears had the wisdom to set up a system where everyone in this country would have a free secondary education. And that may have been enough then, but for our nation to regain its global competitive edge, we must provide higher education, either a college education or technical education, but it's for the future of our country and to meet the ideal in this nation of equality, of opportunity, that we should provide a free and equal educational opportunity in colleges, in technical schools, and do the right thing for the future of our country and for our young people. This is not a radical idea. It's done in many parts of the world, and it pays off huge dividends as to those students who are saddled with this enormous tuition debt now, it's reached over a trillion dollars, more than the entire credit card debt in this country. And what did Congress do for their fat cat contributors? They made student debt non-dischargeable in bankruptcy. So you can go charge a Maserati on your credit card and, and write that off in bankruptcy but somebody that went out and did what they could to get a decent education can't get a new start. So we need to demand of Congress allow the dischargeability and bankruptcy of student debt now. Thank you. Uh, Virgil, Virgil Good on college. You might not get what you want to hear from me, but you're going to get straight talk. We can't afford more federally subsidized student loans, and we can't afford more Pell Grants. I wish I could stand here and tell you, yes, we can give you more. No one's going to have to pay for it. Our debt of $16 trillion is bearing down on us, and as Governor Johnson said, we could well be like Germany after World War I. I do not support, and the person that uh, asked the question on the internet is not going to like it, but we can't afford more Pell Grants and more federally subsidized student loans, certainly not at this time. We've got to balance the budget and decline the debt. All right, now, anybody have a rebuttal? Rebuttal. Rebuttal, rebuttal. Governor. Free comes with a cost. Free. <laughs> Free, very simply, is spending more money than what you take in. Free is simply accumulating more to the $16 trillion in debt that we currently have. Free is gotten us to the point where we are going to experience a monetary collapse in this country due to the fact that we continue to borrow and print more money than, than we take in. We're printing and borrowing money to the tune of 43 cents out of every dollar we spend. Free, the Federal Reserve System in this country. The, the uh, Treasury prints money. They give it to the Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve gives the money to the banks at 0%. Do they give it to you or I? No, they buy up treasuries in a closed loop, making profits off of you and I with no risk whatsoever. This is what has to stop in this country, is the notion of free. There needs to be a level playing field for everybody. Any other rebuttals? Yes. Rocky. I so disagree with both Gary Johnson and Virgil Good on this. We cannot afford not to provide a great education and equality of opportunity for all of our young people in this country. We need to insist on prosperity not austerity, and in a recession, it's not time for these massive spending cuts as called for by Bull Simpson and by both of these people running for president with the major parties. We need to get behind our workers and our young people and provide what's going to build this nation in the future. Great jobs and a great first-class education. Jill and Ben Burton. Jill. 
Rebuttal, Jill. Uh, I'm agreeing uh, with Rocky here that we cannot afford not to educate our students. Our younger generation is the greatest resource we have, and their participation in our economy is not just good for them, it's good for all of us. Every generation, the economy needs to be rebooted by fresh imagination and by the fresh genius of a new generation. That doesn't happen when a generation is locked into being indentured servants. That's what our students are now. We need to bail them out and create free public higher education. Okay. Virgil, rebuttal. Simply point out, both Barack Obama and Mitt Romney in the last debate, Romney said, I'm for expanding uh, student loans and Pell Grants. You've got four candidates you can look to if that's your big <laughs> issue. <laughs> All right, the fifth question for tonight's debate centers on civil rights. Like the previous questions, it was submitted via social media and is being presented exactly as sent to us. The question comes from Melissa Farley on Twitter. This is the, for the candidates, and this go-round will begin back with Jill. Where do you stand on NDAA Section 1021? the ability to detain Americans indefinitely. Where do you stand on that and why? Jill. It's an outrage that 1021 NDAA was ever passed to start with. It's an incredible betrayal of our civil liberties that the president has assumed dictatorial rights to put us in prison at his pleasure without charge or without trial. This is unallowable and is a basic offense against the very foundation of American liberty. And it should be repealed. And while we're at it, we must also repeal the, uh, the, the president's interpretation of the, uh, of the Enforcement Act in 2001, the Military Use Act, that said that assassinations are in the power of this president. We need to put an end to assassinations. We need to put an end to the FISA Act, which retroactively legalized unwarranted wiretapping against U.S. citizens. We need to repeal the Patriot Act, and we, need, and we need to stop the persecution of whistleblowers who blow the whistle on crimes by our government. In ten seconds, Jill. Ten seconds. As Benjamin Franklin said, if we sacrifice our liberty, for security, we will wind up losing both. So let's take back our liberty. That is the foundation of true security. Rocky, the question of detaining Americans indefinitely. Well, I went to law school because I believed that as deeply as one can believe in the rule of law, in justice, in the fact that our system of justice can provide uh, for everyone. And what we have seen with, through the Bush years and now with President Obama has been so absolutely subversive and anti-American. There's been no more anti-American act, I think, in our history than the NDAA. And President Obama, don't be fooled about this, in 2009, he asked for the power to indefinitely detain people without charges, without a trial, without legal assistance, and without the right of habeas corpus. We are on the road toward totalitarianism, and that's not an exaggeration. Take a look at this. If one person, if one person can determine against whom and under what conditions laws passed by Congress and our Constitution are going to be applied, that spells 
tyranny. It's the very definition of tyranny. So what happened when President Obama came into office? He said, oh, about our international treaties and our own domestic laws, absolutely forbidding torture. Let's forget about those war crimes and move forward and not look backwards. What about those people that committed countless federal felonies by illegally spying on American citizens? He said, let's forget about it. And he did the same thing when he was in the United States Senate and after he'd promised just the opposite to everybody before he got the Democratic nomination, he voted for retroactive immunity, criminal immunity, for the telecom companies that participated in the illegal surveillance program. All right. That shows such utter disregard for the rule of law. We need to demand more of our leaders or we'll Question. never. All right. Virgil, good. We'll never meet right. the promise uh, Rocky, of our founders Rocky, and our Rocky. Constitution. Uh, Virgil. One, one sentence answer, Larry. If I were president, I would have vetoed NDAA. Why can't we all be that simple? Okay. Governor? Well, because, Larry, this is like shamelessly pitching oneself to vote for me. So I'm going to try and take advantage of shamelessly pitching myself here. Um, I would have vetoed the National Defense Authorization Act, allowing for you and I, as U.S. citizens, to be arrested and detained without being charged. I think what's really significant is last year, last December, the ACLU came out with a report card on all of the presidential candidates. And I apologize to the three others on stage that weren't in this report card. But they came out with a report card on all the presidential candidates. ACLU, ACLU, a group dedicated to civil liberties, a group dedicated to the Constitution, a group dedicated to the first 10 amendments of the Constitution, a Bill of Rights. I think this is really important. 24 Liberty Torches was a perfect score. Mitt Romney and Rick Santorum had zero Liberty Torches out of 24. Newt Gingrich had four Liberty Torches out of 24. Barack Obama had 16 Liberty Torches out of 24. My hero, Ron Paul, 18 Liberty Torches out of 24. And Gary Johnson had 21 Liberty Torches out of 24, something that I'm very proud of. Okay, any re <laughs> anybody rebuttal? I guess we all agree on that. All right, we go to question number six. We will, by the way, have a discussion on this, and we'll have two-minute closing comments as well. To begin this round, we'll start with Rocky. The sixth and final debate question was selected by my editorial team from the many questions submitted to us via social media. In a post to Facebook, Russell Hate. Russ Haight asked the presidential candidates this. You have to think about this. And we start with uh, Rocky. If you had the opportunity to write one constitutional amendment with an absolute guarantee it would be approved by Congress, and then following that, three-fourths of the state legislatures, what would you amend? I've already written it. Please take a look at our website, voterocky.org. It's the new Equal Rights Amendment promising that equal rights under the law will never be abridged on account of gender or sexual orientation. It's time that we have federal protection for members of our GLBT community and absolutely prohibit any discrimination on account of gender. That amendment uh, without the sexual orientation provision, failed by not getting the approval of only three states in this country. It's high time we revive it, add sexual orientation and gender identification, and make that statement as a nation that will never allow discrimination on those grounds again. Do you, uh, before the others respond, do you think, Rocky, that would pass today? I do think it would pass if the people made it clear that we insist upon it and there will be a heavy political price paid by anybody in Congress or in the White House who opposes it. It's really up to us. Major social movements in this country always started at the grassroots level. We are the leaders. Let's make them follow us. Virgil, well, what, what would, how would you like to amend the Constitution? Term limits. If we, don't, 
If we don't adopt term limits, you are going to continue to have a Congress that is always worried about the next election instead of what's best for the country. And let me say this, if we could get it through Congress, and you might have to grandfather all the members of Congress there right now, which I wouldn't want to do, but you might have to. I'm for term limits between six years and 12 years. I don't care what it is, whether it's six, eight, 10, or 12. It would enhance Washington so much because I was there 12 years. It's a constant worry about the next election. Where's the next fundraiser going to be? Who are the PACs going to be there giving me money so I'll be able to outspend my opponents? You watch the Chicago television. It is constant advertising. And the PACs are the biggest contributors to that for congressional elections. I will tell you this. If we could get it through the House and the Senate, it would go like a knife through hot butter of the state legislatures. Term limits night. Are they? As a, as a, as a follow-up, Virgil, you think they'd vote themselves out of office? Uh, no, that's why I said you would probably have grandfather. grandfather those now. I think you could get it through if you would grandfather now or at least let it start by giving them, if it was a 12-year, uh, give them 12, year, 12 more years. And that would get it through. Governor, what's your constitutional amendment? Term limits. The root of all evil are politicians that beat their chests, and in the name of electing me or re-electing me, we're going to end the war on terror, we're going to take care of the illegal immigrant, we're going to take care of health care, we're going to have free education for everybody, we're going to end the drug wars. You name it, elect me, re-elect me, I'm going to save the world. And Congress gets elected. We need to balance, I hear congressional ads running all the time, we need to balance the federal budget the next ad that runs is, here's the bacon that I've brought home to my state, amounting to billions of dollars, and if you want the bacon to continue to be brought home, vote for me. I think I'm living proof that term limits work. Look, I really enjoyed being governor of New Mexico. I really enjoyed it, but I, ha but I knew that, it was, that I was term limited. I had eight years. Did I push the envelope as much as I might have pushed it if I'd have had four years as opposed to eight years? I don't think I did. I think I pushed the envelope just far enough to get reelected, and I got reelected in a state that was two to one Democrat, but I got reelected, and then it was, man, this is all about doing the right thing. I do not want to leave office thinking coulda, shoulda, woulda. So term limits, in my opinion, really is the silver bullet. Politicians would get elected and do the right thing as opposed to whatever it takes to get elected and re-elected. And uh, Jill, how would you amend the Constitution? But my concern is that even with term limits, unfortunately, corporations and big money can still buy what they want and are still buying our candidates. Because they get them into office anyhow, whether it's for four years or eight years. So I want to pass the amendment that will clarify that money is not speech and corporations are not people. Because in stealing our rights of personhood, Corporations have done exactly that. They have gotten the rights of personhood and have basically taken away our rights of personhood. So corporations can fight and stop and block the laws that we need to protect our air and our water and our climate and worker safety and public health and campaign finance. These are not constitutional issues that belong to corporations. These are political questions that should be decided by communities through the political and legislative process. We should not be precluded from forming the laws that we decide we need because corporations say that our forming such laws and protecting ourselves is against the Constitution. That is a violation of what the writers of the Constitution intended.
and I will support that amendment to clarify, to get our constitutional rights back from the corporations that have seized them. Uh, this has been a very lively evening. You will each have uh, two minutes to uh, close, is that correct? That's correct. All right. Got and it. We start with the way we started, or do we go round about? We're actually going to go next in line to Virgil. Okay. This is two minutes, closing statements. You don't have to rebut them. You can say anything you like. Again, thanks to Free and Equal, thanks to Larry King, thanks to Gary, Rocky, and Jill. Open up the process, give broader views to Americans, and we will have a better and greater country. Four things that we've got to do right away, I repeat, balanced budget now, not 10 years down the road like Obama and Romney are talking about. Jobs in America for American citizens first. I am the only candidate that has advocated a near complete moratorium on green card foreign worker admissions into this country until unemployment is under 5%. It makes no sense to bring in so many foreign workers when we need jobs in America for U.S. citizens first. <laughs> Thirdly, I agree with Jill on super PACs and PACs and defining speech, but I don't think you need a constant, I think it can be done uh, with legislation with enough whereases and a sense of the House and a sense of the Senate in it. I want to see political action committees eliminated, individual donations only, full transparency, and we need to end the super PACs that are totally just about controlling federal elections. It's time for a grassroots candidate like Virgil Goode to be president, and he'll work for term limits too. Governor? I would not be standing here before you right now if I didn't think I could do a really good job as President of the United States. And I am basing that on the resume that I have. I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. Uh, I started a one-man handyman business when I was a junior in college and actually grew that business to employ over a thousand people in Albuquerque. It's amazing what can happen when you say you'll, when you do what you'll say you'll do and when you show up on time. It's just amazing. Now I sold that business in 1999. Nobody lost their job. Business is doing better than ever. As governor of New Mexico, I ran completely outside of the political system. I got elected governor, Republican governor, in a state that was two to one Democrat and made a name for myself vetoing legislation. I may have vetoed more legislation than the other 49 governors in the country combined. I vetoed 750 bills. I had thousands of line item vetoes. It made a difference when it came to billions of dollars worth of spending. It made a difference when it came to laws that would have told you or I what we could or couldn't do in the bedroom. With regard to immigration, which I think really is a hot button issue and it kind of highlights differences between me and everybody else, let's start off with the premise that immigration is really a good thing. Let's make it as easy as possible for somebody that wants to come into this country and work to get a work visa. Not a green card, not citizenship, but a work visa so that applicable taxes would get paid uh, and that we would have no criminals working in this country. Look, we hear about wasted vote right now. Wasting your vote is voting for somebody that you don't believe in. That's wasting your vote. I'm asking everybody here, I'm asking everybody watching this nationwide to waste your vote on me. Vote for me, Gary Johnson, and you know what happens? I'm the next President of the United States, and I guarantee you, nobody will regret that. You'll find somebody with no quit. You'll find somebody that will wake up every single day and take on the debates and the discussions that need to be happening in this country and aren't happening today because of a lack of leadership. Thank you, Governor. Jill Stein, Jill, two minutes. There's a famous saying from Alice Walker, 
that the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing we have it to start with. In fact, there are 90 million voters who are not coming out to vote in this election. That's one out of every two voters. That's twice as many as the number who will come out for Barack Obama and twice as many as the number who will come out for Mitt Romney. Those are voters who are saying no to politics as usual and saying no to the Democratic and Republican parties. Imagine if we got out word to those 90 million voters that they actually have a variety of choices and voices in this election. And I want to focus especially on those 36 million students and young people and recent graduates who are effectively indentured servants because of the high unemployment rate and the draconian, unforgiving loans that have been customized especially for students lacking any consumer protections. If those students decided to stand up and go to the polls and come out and vote for free public higher education, for ending student debt, for bailing out the students and breaking up the banks instead of the other way around, which is what they are doing, we could turn politics in this country on its head on November 6th. I encourage you, go to my website, get the word out. There is a choice in this election to take back our democracy, to create jobs for everyone through a Green New Deal that will put an end to climate change and make wars for oil okay. obsolete. We can do this now by standing up and making it so. Thank you, Jill. And finally, Rocky Anderson. Imagine if there had been a candidate included in the Obama-Romney debates to challenge our plutocracy, our government that is run by and for the benefit of monstrous corporations rather than in the interest of the people of this country. We know the Republican and Democrats have some differences, but both of them have morphed into a militarist, corporatist, anti-democratic force that has betrayed basic human and civil rights. We know that both of these major candidates have been bought and paid for. That's why neither of them stands for health care for all as in the rest of the industrialized world. It's why neither of them ever talk about breaking the stranglehold the military industrial complex has on our government. And that's why neither of them talk about providing the essential leadership on the climate crisis, the greatest tragedy facing Earth's inhabitants. Obama and Romney have refused to discuss the corrupting influence of money flowing from Wall Street banks, from the insurance companies, the pharmaceutical industry, the fossil fuel industry, or military contractors because they are the recipients of that corrupting money. And neither of these dominant party candidates will have called for federal protection for marriage equality. Neither of them have called for an end to poverty, an end to the insane war on drugs, or for the implementation of a WPA-like initiative that would hire millions of workers. So thank you to Christina Tobin and Larry King and Free and Equal for providing this opportunity to present democratic solutions in the public interest on which we can all work together far beyond this election. Uh, first of all, uh, as, as a moderator and a host for uh, 55 years, I've always believed in free speech and the right of people to throw their hat into the ring and for the right of people to be heard. Going back to uh, uh, years ago when I introduced Ross Perot to the public and got to hear his thoughts and John Anderson before that in Illinois and uh, Ralph Nader and the others who have come forward to uh, go to the battle. You're kind of Don Quixote's in a way, but uh, the windmills have a way of stopping and we have a way of saluting you just for getting into the fray. So I thank you for your efforts and all you've done. I also want to uh, salute uh, Christina and what she does. How did, how did, uh, thank you, thank 
Yeah. Christina's gonna, gonna wind things up, but how did, how did Free and Equal start? Well, it came from my dad. You may recall him, Jim Tobin. He ran for governor here back in 1998. And so today's his birthday. Happy birthday, Dad. And his, <laughs> my legacy of, through him and Taxpayers United of America it lives through him. And so now we have Free and Equal Elections, a nonpartisan organization uniting the grassroots movement across the spectrum to break the stranglehold of the two-party system, to bring the power back to the people. <laughs> I know uh, Christina has some closing remarks. I want to thank uh, Gary Johnson, Jill Stein, Rocky Anderson, and Virgil Hamlin Good for participating in this. It was my pleasure to be here, and I thank you all very much. And thanks to the audience as well. And I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Christina Tobin for the close. Christina? I, I want to I want to thank Larry King for dream come true. Larry, please. <laughs> of course, my executive producer Marcy Forgrave and producer Gary Franchi, the whole crew of people. Thank you to them, all of our supporters out there, and the candidates, and we the people. And I have some good news for you. How many people enjoyed this debate tonight? How many people want to see a second debate? <laughs> well, here, here at Free and Equal, we're a nonpartisan organization. All the donations go through great things like this and big things we're doing after the election. But we are holding a debate next Tuesday in Washington, D.C., 9 p.m. Eastern Time. And thanks to one of our sponsors, Rob Ritchie with FairVote.org, we're going to implement instant runoff voting. And you can go on our website tonight to vote for the candidates that you want, the two candidates with the highest votes of free and equal, free, A-N-D, equal.org, through instant runoff voting. The same the Grammys, the Rick gets rid of the spoiler effect. You have 24 hours to vote. Go online when you go home today to vote. And on Thursday morning, we will announce the two candidates with the most votes who will be in Washington, D.C to debate on international issues. Please vote tonight, freeandequal.org. So thank you, Larry. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Great pleasure being with you. Always love coming to Chicago. Thanks very much. We the people. We the people. Good night, everybody. <laughs>